should be going. Give it a few moments just to start gearing in. Wait, see if the YouTube stream is actually going. Yes, start it is. All right. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back again. Are you good people? Hello to all the good people in the chat. I thought it would be nice to begin this episode with that track from Jeff C. Because the, the whole beginning of these podcasts was inspired by his work to a large degree and all the work of other people involved and those people that contribute as well in the chat and sharing links and interacting with each other and sharing information and of course of the great content creators so we come back again this time uh, i've left the initial uh, podcast an ice cream social the title an ice cream social that's uh, a few episodes back on my channel, I think, of the live broadcast. I've left that one as it is. I'm not going to change the title or try to put it into a ser series like these are going to be. I want that to sort of stand on its own uh, as the an initial inspiration and to be its um, uh, representation of acknowledgement of Jeff's work and the, the legacy of that work. That's why it was the ice cream social, because we were referencing a lot of the work he did about that concept of the ice cream 
fake food production that has been geared up over the last few years. So from now, it's going to be the ice cream social e socially ice cream socially. I hope people get it. You know what I'm like for playing puns and stuff. But yeah, a little bit of word manipulation to add some extra context and meaning to to phrases. So yeah, ice cream social episode one. And as we said uh, in that previous, in that original episode, um, we're going to do this semi-regularly, but somewhat infrequently. It's not going to be every week, but we'll do them as regularly as we can for now. We'll see how things progress and build them up, maybe uh, make it a bit more often. I don't know. <laughs> it's often difficult to coordinate when we're interacting internationally. You know, we've got people from multiple countries, from America and Europe and here in the UK. So coordinating timing and arranging dates and times and stuff can often take a little bit of organisation, which I'm terrible at. So thanks to Camille for getting things going in that respect, getting it organised and arranging the times. Um, but yes, we come back again to talk about a lot of the subjects that are very relevant at the moment and also to give some acknowledgement again to that work that Jeff put in to all these subjects and trying to get this information out to people. Uh, I'm really glad for Anonymous you re-uploaded your chat with him from last year, I think it was. Um, well, it was 2019, wasn't it? So prior to last year. No, no, it was, it was uh, 2020, I believe. It was just right after the the, the beginning of the, the big event. Oh, right. So it was at the beginning of last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And you were talking about the, the concept of the ectogenesis primarily, but obviously that included a lot more stuff to do with cloning and the, the, the heritage, the history of eugenics and how it interweaves into a lot of the technology that's now being presented and pushed, like the the mRNA and the CRISPR technologies. So, yeah, please check out Venonymous's channel. He re-uploaded that uh, conversation just this afternoon. I managed to listen to about another hour of it this afternoon right, while I was sorting out, setting this up. Um, <coughs> there's loads of great information in that. So yeah, it's really good. Go on. I was just saying, it's by far one of my most favorite conversations I ever had on uh, yeah. online. Yeah, it is really, really good, and there's loads of great reference points in there. So please check it out, people, and check out everyone else's channel as well. Please stop the ride. I haven't got a link for Pete because uh, Pete's mainly about joining in with these conversations, I think. <laughs> and I have. Um, sent out other invites as well we don't know other people might turn up as we go along because it's a little bit early for us here in the uk and in europe uh it's like just six just gone 6 p.m here in the uk but obviously for you, you guys over in the us it's mid-afternoon so good afternoon to everyone and good evening to everyone in europe and uh, i suppose it'd be good morning tomorrow you know, to all the time travelers that are in the future time zones. But yeah, I thought it would be nice to begin by replaying that track from Jeff because it's got a very uh, good uh, uplifting vibe to it. It's got a very optimistic uh, tone to it, which when we're talking about a lot of these subjects and a lot of the things that have happened in recent times and over the last year, they can often get quite dark and depressing. So I thought it'd be a good way to set the tone and begin the process of, you know, there, there are still possibilities. Uh, the reality that we can see a lot of these things that they're doing and we can point at them and call them out and they are having to react to them. They're having to change their narratives uh, on a fairly regular basis to try and compensate for people asking questions or pushing back against their their uh, scripted agendas yeah it's uh it's a a lot of optimistic possibilities it's not all just doom and gloom so I've, i thought it would be appropriate 
to I actually, <clears throat> I actually just listened to that song on the ride over here because I made a CD of all the right. music. So good choice. Yeah, Hi. definitely. Hello, Camille. Hello to everyone. Sorry, I'm doing my usual rambling at the start. I think I've said enough. <laughs> let's, uh, you know, let's jump in and start talking about some of these subjects. Like, I, I've given it the kind of catch all title of the digital gulag, but I feel that there are obviously a lot more elements to it than it just being digital because what is happening in a lot of this digital transition they're trying to force onto people is it is having a very literal physical effect on people and the world we live in the society we share with each other so even though it's called the digital gulag it involves a very definite physical uh, gulag element to it and of course it includes things like the genetics manipulation which is why i thought it was you know very appropriate to listen again to the conversation that anonymous and jeff had last year because a lot of these things are now being presented uh in the usual kind of disguised and spun narrative fashion that the system likes to do but a lot of these concepts are now being represented to the public uh, suggestions of having a uh, medical treatment. I don't want to use the V word because otherwise I might get a slap on the wrist <coughs> again. <laughs> but yeah, these uh, suggested medical treatments, which the the producers themselves have acknowledged could have an effect on fertility. And therefore, if it does affect the fertility of the population, where, where did where do you go from there? You have to start bringing in other technology to compensate for that loss of fertility. Did you guys know, I didn't know until a couple few weeks ago, that, you know, the one company, Venonymous, I know, you know, the CureVac, backed by Bill, of course, but the ones with the mRNA printer that they're working on with Tesla. But did you know, and I have, I think it's ready on my screen here, the, uh, that Bayer is, they partnered with Bayer to make the shots. Mm, I didn't know. was not aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds comforting, I would say. You know, like, that's just great. Of course. Yeah, who else now would I you want? Very safe. Yes. Step right up for CureVac when they're ready. Yeah. Uh, it's good it's stuff really good. there. <laughs> Green. Uh, vaccine manufacturer Greenhorn Bayer to make 160 million doses of CureVax COVID-19 shot. They say, although we have not previously produced vaccines, <laughs> they're pretty strong with the biotech, so it'll be, it'll be fine. Everything's um, fine. I wonder who are the major shareholders in that particular company. Yeah. Didn't uh -huh. they buy uh, Monsanto? Uh, Bayer, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Bayer absorbed Monsanto. Yeah, so yeah, Biotech. I think it's <laughs> GMOs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm just being a bit sort of pedantic with wording, but I think it's it is more like they absorb each other rather than they buy each other out because the the system that mega corporate system is so intertwined. You know, they're not exactly buying things; they're just moving money from one place to another. Yeah, the constant yeah. shuffle. Yeah. And in the process, they're absorbing each other's corporations and then handing them over to somebody else. Yeah? <sighs> but the, the financial interconnections, um, I feel, they're, they're part of the, the thread, the web, that demonstrates that there is an interconnected structure with all of these things. This is not an, uh, what, what could I call it, an organically capitalist-driven system. You know, many people have referred to it as crony capitalism because of that kind of uh, insider dealing and control. But I, I think it gets a lot further than that. You know, it's the, the intertwining of those threads means that, like I say, they don't exactly buy each other's companies. They just sort of exchange them and they absorb into monopolies. So now Bayer is an even bigger monopoly than it was before. But, you know. That's been quite true for what, a hundred years? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's good stuff. Hey, bef I I have it here open. I don't know. Do you mind if I share a friend's 
thing just so people can look at it. I know I sent it to Anonymous, yeah. but yeah, this, yeah. uh, this is my friend Patrick Jordan is working with a friend of his, his friend Zeta. At the artwork here is amazing, but they have write ups. I won't click on the image, may be disturbing. You could open that yourself. But the uh, there's so many. They did this whole series of artwork that they they're already you can't see places where they've tried to post it at and things. But very interesting. I'll put the links. I'll put the links, of course, together afterward. But just some crazy, crazy artwork. Anyway. It's cool. politicalartfriendsetta.com. So, anyway. Uh, a, a little bit like, um, was, it, was it Alex Gray? No, oh, I don't know Alex Gray. No, he, he was more sort of esoteric, psychotropic art, wasn't he? Um, David Dees. I know that name. Yeah, David Dees. He used to do a lot of that kind of uh, political artwork. Well, highly political artwork, most of his stuff. That's cool. I'm glad, you know, people... This is sub, you know, a subject we've often talked about. You say that there's a there's ways this kind of information can be conveyed. It doesn't just have to be done in kind of like a lecture presentation or a, a PDF document or whatever. You know, there's many different ways you can present this kind of information to people. And there um, are write-ups that go with some of these, but it's mm. yeah, crazy. An artwork, be it visual or auditory you know music or imagery can often convey a lot more information in a lot quicker and simpler fashion to the the viewing audience you know it's it's much more reachable to a lot more people mm -hmm. uh, not that many people are willing to sit and listen to people talk for two hours about documents and yeah, news articles and things like that, whereas an image can convey the same information or a lot of the same information. So it's yeah. good. Yeah, please share the links and uh, if you've got them and I'll post them in the chat room. Oh, yeah, I'll grab that one. Do -do -do -do. And hello to everyone in the chat room. Thanks for jumping in, guys. I know it was a bit... Uh, not so much late notice, but I didn't exactly have that much notice, only about half an hour, I think. And that's even if YouTube actually did its thing and sent notifications out properly. Right, Come on, I'll grab that and share it into the chat room. Thank you. You know, when I was uploading that video earlier today, or, or actually I did it last night, um, they have a new thing on the for the YouTube uploading a, a new uh, step called checks. Yeah. So they, like pre screen your upload now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw a notification for that as well. And yeah, they, 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 they will pre scan for any potential copyright issues. Yeah. But they also make sure to say that even though it, it cleared this time, it may be a problem further on, you know, later on after you've uploaded it. Mm -hmm. So they'll still get you even if it's yeah. cleared the first time. That that's that sounds a little bit like a bit of uh, legalese to give them the deniability because what they're really screening for with that pre-screen check is you saying naughty things, you know, you using the words that are on that blacklist of forbidden words or phrases or topics, and the reason they're acknowledging that some problem could occur after you've uploaded the video is because as far as I know, anyway, this is the way the software works. Copyright issues would not become apparent until after your video is accessible by the the system that checks it against all already existing uh, content. You know, so it compares the content of your video to videos that are already out there and sees if there's any matches. And that's how they spot the copyright issues or if somebody reports your video as having their content in it, things like that. So they're, they're acknowledging that it's not really about copyright. It's about them pre-scanning your stuff to see if it's going to be allowed or not. Yeah, I saw they, they took down Jeff's last video for uh, community guidelines. That's gone now. The, and that was the ice cream one, wasn't it? Uh, the one, the... 33 layers of deception, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Well, I have actually got a copy of that one. I might re-upload that on my Odyssey channel then. There you go. Yes, folks, if you, did, if you didn't know, I do now have an Odyssey channel. Just search for my channel name on Odyssey and it should come up. Um, and all of these videos will be auto-copied onto that channel. And I can, you know, I'll re-upload Jeff's 33 levels onto there. I could get that done tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Cookie. I haven't got all his stuff. I've only got a few of his videos. And I know there are other people who are already, you know, attempting to archive all his work before it disappears. So have a check around, folks, and hopefully you will find someone that has copies of all his work, or well, certainly the majority of it. I know some things are somewhat unrecoverable because they were removed mid-live stream and things like that. Uh, well... Speaking about that kind of social media, maybe it's a good opportunity to share one of the screens. This is from one of the links that you sent me, Anonymous, the uh, building, what was it called? Building a better social network, building a more honest internet, <laughs> which I thought was, um, you know, somewhat of the typical <laughs> innocuous title. Uh, and it's worded in a somewhat simplistic fashion. You know, it's not an exactly academically in-depth article. Um, but this is talking right. about the, what, the what first, social media looks like. The first big chunk like of it, it's uh, all like about radio and stuff. So you might want to skip like to the middle. Yeah, I will do. Um, what would social media look like if it served the public interest? That's the concept they're supposedly going to address uh, and yeah, a lot of this first, but probably the first half of the article is about the rise of the radio and how it led to institutions such as the BBC. Yeah, the the UK, United Kingdom used a different route, using rather than the unfettered commercialism of other countries. The UK's model, a single public entity, the British Broadcasting Company. Yeah, it used to be a company when it first started. Then they changed it to a corporation. And there's a definite reason for that difference. But anyway, yeah. The rise of the radio led to what would now be referred to as an institution, the institution of the BBC, and how they uh, perfected the uh, pretense of being a guide, philosopher, and friend to the listener. <laughs> I thought that was quite quite telling of what the article is really about here um but yeah if you keep working down through it it then makes the the correlation between the rise of the radio to the rise of the internet and it talks about things like the development of the domination of groups like facebook and how facebook have actually had to admit that yes their platform could influence elections if uh, used in a certain way <coughs> and uh, the dominance of other so they're not strictly speaking true monopolies but they pretty much are monopolies considering how big they are in the virtual space uh, systems in china russia wechat and v connect or v contact sorry in russia the dominance of wikipedia uh, I'll put the link in the, the chat for this article, so when I'm blathering. Is there anything in particular you wanted to point at in this one, then? Because um, when I read through it, I saw it, it's quite a general sort of, e it's almost like an easy listening kind of article. You know, it's it's not very hard hitting. And it's just trying to give that spin of like, don't worry, folks, these platforms will actually be for our benefit, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think it just kind of like helps to paint that picture to pe in people's minds of how um, if we don't, these uh, social medias, they need to change in a way that are more personalizable. Just kind of creating mm -hmm. that um, customizable uh, social media kind of thing that I've been seeing a trend in uh, news articles. Oh, sorry. They probably need to know more about you to personalize it super well, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, I'm, I'm rereading that 
Dave Eggers, The Circle. I've been rereading all kinds of the cultural reference books, but the um, in there where all of the big Facebook and Google and Twitter, and they're all rolled into one and they're all one giant that every, your payments, everything like WeChat, you know, where everything is hooked into the same app sort of thing. It's mm -hmm. the, the digital yeah. gulag. It's terrifying. That book, it's the new 1984 because the cameras everywhere, like little ones mm -hmm. that the, the people, the people put out there to stand up against injustice and mm -hmm. like being able to hunt people down as a group, Pokemon Go style to save children. Yeah. You know? Or the um, shout out to Days for pointing this one out. The, the certain social sort of uh, Call them kind of like volunteer groups. They are verging onto vigilante groups. What used to be like the the paedophile hunters or the sex offender offender hunters. You know the people who would work like private investigators to track down offenders. Mm -hmm. They can be transitioned now to vaccine. Oh, shit, I said it. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the the V word offenders, basically people who are refusing to have the the V. Or the way it's been initially presented, as they usually do, you know, supposedly they're doing these things to help you because they care about you and they want Aww. to look after your health. So they're, at the moment, they're presenting it as being like uh, for people who maybe don't realize there's a pandemic and don't realize <laughs> that they could go and get their injection or they don't know how to do it or they don't know what center to go to visit to get. So these people are sort of like, uh, social workers that are helping them to find access to get the 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 injection you know that's what it is at the moment but that could quite easily be switched to a situation where if, if for whatever way they do it if there is some kind of mandate or legal enforcement then they are becoming the people that will be tracking you down to say you don't have yours uh, you need to go to the quarantine centre. Yeah, I'll just point this bit out because I thought this was, you know, this is part of the spin. <clears throat> the the initial sort of power, well, not the whole paragraph, I'm not going to read, but just this initial first part. Consider social media. Research suggests that social platforms may be increasing politis, political polarisation, straining social ties and causing us anxiety and depression. Facebook is criticized for creating echo chambers and filter bubbles in which people only encounter content, sometimes inaccurate content, that reinforces their prejudices. Prejudices. Get all my judices out. Um, the reason I think that, you know, that is just like, that's them setting the argument on the table so that they can then proceed to spin or debunk or redirect that argument and never actually address it. Nobody asks the question in the article of like, well, hang on a minute, how are Facebook able to do that? What is the level of strain on social ties? What is the level of anxiety and depression? If it's severe, then surely we be, should be looking at shutting down these services if they cause that people that much problem. Yeah, when we've got a large, a large number of the nation's political systems around the world are going through uh, difficulties, you know, to put it mildly. Then shouldn't we be looking at, well, is it the social media systems that are causing all this destabilization around the world? Well, and they already had those like top executives that came out however many years ago talking about how bad these platforms are and they won't let their families, <clears throat> they won't let their families on there. Yeah. And this is, that's exactly the main reason I wanted to point at this one, because there is documentable evidence, Facebook insiders admitting and Facebook being somewhat held to account for this and having to admit in various statements that yes, they did manipulate their their user base when they were unaware of it you know they had to admit yeah to they had running, to tell so, you yeah they, they were running social experiments without the participants consent oops yeah. so yeah. they've been caught out of doing this and what this article in, in no way tries to address is there is demonstrable proof 
that these systems create chemical addictions within people. And mm -hmm. then that, that's even not adding into that question of social addictions, psychological addictions, and how the entire structure that they call social media is being embedded into and integrated with our societies, with our general day-to-day -day life, such that now we have this contemporary situation where the, the system is uh, suggesting, and I'm using that word you know, sarcastically, that everybody has to have some form of biometric digital ID that allows you to do, you know, or gives you certain allowances in one way or another, you know, to go places or to show your certificate that you've received a certain injection or whatever. If these systems have been shown to be addictive in that fashion, then I go back to my previous point of like, well, why are they not raising the question of like, how much damage is this, is this system of what we call social media doing? Rather than talking about, you know, we, oh, we, can, we can create something publicly driven, folks. It's like the BBC. Rather than asking that kind of question, it's like, hang on. So you're suggesting that there will be, uh, you know, the cause and the, the damage won't matter as much because it's a publicly run institution of social media. Well, and the, they're providing these uh, mental health chat bots and things. It's it's okay mm -hmm. if they've broken people because they've they've got all the ways to fix you. I'm doing the bunny ears <laughs> for yeah, yeah. the fix. I was just watching a video yesterday. Um, I think I have it on my screen. I was just watching a video yesterday from those uh, that data and society group that. Um, uh, I know that Bill, Bill and Melinda back them and all kinds of big names back this data and society. They, they were hunting people back in the day of like Parkland and things that the meanies online, but um, they're, they're interesting, but they were talking about the vaccine or the, the jab the passports. Yeah. The V they were talking about the passports and they're with this group, this, uh, uh, Ada Lovelace, I think it said, but that they, and those people had been looking at this idea for a year now. <laughs> it's not, it's not something that they're just decided to do now, but they have this guy on there who's from India and he talks about how they'd been building this biometric um, system in India to tie everything together, the banking and your dog washing and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, that they've been doing that for, I think he said a decade and that, that it's so easy to layer into that system, their little passports. And they got people on that system. He said in the beginning, because uh, the government started giving money to people. Yeah. And, and so I don't know where anybody's doing that, but yeah, that the government would send out money. And that was the initial incentive to get people on there. But it made me think of uh, a couple few years back when Corbett, did uh, the biometric, we looked all around the world. I know I participated in it. All of the the different countries that were building their biometric systems for their, mm -hmm. their people. So it's like how yeah. many are ready to snap it right in place and, uh, and add all these other goodies. Almost as if there's an international coordination of some kind. Almost, you know, <laughs> it's, that would be crazy. But they, they talk in this thing, they're like, we have to be able to give the differential rights and freedoms, you know, this will allow them to, to pick and choose. And yeah, yeah, it is yeah. good, good stuff. But that they want to leave it to states and businesses for now for, on the federal level that uh, that the government, it's not time for the government to step in and say, the federal government to step in and say that we have to have this. But just like the the masks and all of the things that is your your stores, your co-ops like mine. Well, it's almost not mine. I'm about to quit. But yeah, yeah pushed remember, along by them. I remember Jeff mentioning about the... Um, the the suggestion was it Man Linda? I can't I can't remember. If it was <laughs> yeah. Man, Man Linda or, or Susan? We're good. We're good. Tick tick Hail Susan! Hail Susan! Um, yeah, but on that point, yeah, I remember him talking about that not so long ago, several months ago. <coughs> but just to you know, 
jump back on this article about how this is a you know good example of easy listening misdirection can we imagine a social network designed in a different way to encourage the sharing of mutual understanding rather than misinformation well as a long-standing user of the internet even because before it became what's now known as the world wide web because i was messing around with home computing personal computers since the late 80s uh, so i knew about the internet before it became the world wide web but anyway my question will be hang on that was what the internet was meant to be right from the beginning so now you're suggesting that it never was and that now we need to go a different direction which will actually make it that thing that it was in the first place anyway so again <laughs> it's, it, I know I'm sort of being a bit uh, uh, picky in the sense of, you know, I'm really sort of pulling it to pieces, but that just stands out to me of that kind of uh, um, the, the points within the article that demonstrate that it is, is you know, it's, it's soft soap in, soft soap spin. It's, oh, don't worry, folks, the internet might be causing you problems. It might be dragging you into a digital gulag but it's all right don't you know just remember what the radio was like and how great the bbc used to be oh yeah on that that one show that uh, that silicon valley show i watch and i've talked about several times that this week in google that the one guy he's this journalism person he talks about how we've always had trouble with these new technologies there's always been this moral panic that has come even when it was the newspapers mm. and the radio yeah. and books yeah that it would ruin us since the printing press yeah it's why the print the original printing presses had to be licensed basically yeah, yeah they were controlled by the state Pe people had to be vetted and authorized to have a printing press and print out documentation because they knew the influence it could have. <laughs> but this just. Yeah, I think we're still at that stage where it's the first 10, 20 years of a new technology, mm -hmm. a new way of uh, communicating. And it's a cost benefit and a positive negative. You know, do the positives still outweigh all the negatives? Mm -hmm. I think when, when you look at Facebook and Twitter, it's. <laughs> Right, but mm. people are still going there, and I think if the as soon as the negatives start really outweighing the positives, I think people will leave and look for uh, look elsewhere. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a, push that... it, and I think that's more of the question: How far can we push this? You know, so so mm. people keep on accepting our product. Well, the yeah. baby steps to getting them just used to it. And it, it's always been like this. We've always, yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the saving grace of this article. The one maybe saving grace is they do acknowledge in that final paragraph that, yeah, it, it's up to you, the, the end user. You know, it's up to the public as to what they choose to access, what they choose to allow their energy to go into. Yeah, is it, is it viable? Uh, it is if people want it to be, basically. Yeah. Yeah. If they have the independent thought to, to consider yeah. it could be bad, but oh, they got to be able to see the pictures of their, their cousins, you know, they're yeah. online, they've got to connect. And that uh, does, you know, it, it does bypass the question of, well, should it be there in the first place in the way it is anyway? Yeah. And it's going to be so much scarier when they keep going like that yeah. book that book and then it was a show too the feed where it's the mm -hmm. the implant whatever kind of implant it is but that it's right there and you're always on and people could come yeah. in and experience your own things and and your memory bundles and and mm -hmm. oh it's just crazy and you were the weird ones if you wanted to shut it off and have dinner and not mm -hmm. have everybody in your head yeah there's um there's a little bit that uh Ben and Jeff were referencing in that video. Um, it was approximately an hour into the video because, like I said, I had been watching it earlier. Um, but they mention, Jeff mentions, because they're looking at the BBC articles and then points out the um, the one article about the, the virtual self. Are you ready to meet your virtual self? 
And I know Jeff had talked about that concept on some of his other videos as well. Yeah? They yeah. have been working on this idea of creating virtualized copies of all of us. Your digital twin. Yeah. They use that and, term for machinery and us. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're presenting it as being something that will be fun and convenient for you, the end user, because it will be like a a virtualized avatar that can take over some of the the burdensome requirements of social media so it can automatically reply to messages you receive on different platforms and it will do so in a manner that replicates how you would respond because it's based on you you your personality profile yeah uh. and the one particular article they were looking at was the one where they, they're taking like a digital scan of people. So it can be, it, you know, in a virtual sense, it is you, you know, the, the avatar looks like you and behaves like you because they're mapping all of your personal details so that they can create that virtual clone. Oh, yeah. Well, that, the video I put up the other day with the where they want to take away cameras and turn it all into code that all you have mm -hmm. to do is talk for a few minutes or they could use video that's already out there of you. But that they were saying how your your family could not know if it was you or if it was like yeah. that, it would be that good. And eventually. In, effect, in effect, they could potentially create virtual immortality. Yeah. Because you could have dead relatives that carry on existing. I'm doing the bunny ears thing here. Yeah? Carry on existing in that virtual space as their virtual clones. Well, if Ray Kurzweil can't bring his dad back from the dead, I'm sure he wants to resurrect him in the machine. <laughs> yeah, that's very Metropolis style. Yeah. There's been a <laughs> big uptake in that kind of programming lately of the virtual self, the, the digital mm -hmm. twin. And um, they've, I've, I can't remember where I saw it, but they were making a case that, you know, you need to, uh, to get as much information about you as possible in order to make that digital twin. So that kind of like, goes with the privacy thing they want mm -hmm. to record every single moment of yours uh about you in order to be able yeah. to make an accurate uh representation of yourself there's yeah. a there's a 2009 movie i just heard about called surrogates mm -hmm. i saw yeah, i saw the um, opening trailer of that and it was nuts it was like a um a bunch you know people eventually will uh, live their whole lives through a surrogate uh, robotic body and they just like go in mm -hmm. the virtual reality kind of thing. It's crazy. Yeah. It, it was actually quite a prescient uh, storyline. There's a few different elements in it um, that are quite appropriate to a lot of what's been happening recently. I'm just, um, you know, it's got the usual kind of Hollywood names in it and whatever. Yeah, um, Bruce Willis, but, I believe. Yeah, he, he plays the main sort of protagonist in the storyline. But one of the main sort of elements they play out in the storyline is this idea that as the technology is progressing to that kind of level, you get a split in society. And there are these people who want to return to the land and live in little communes on, on their own property yes. and whatever. And so they're, con they're considered extremists, almost like terrorists. Um, and the leader of that kind of underground movement, because it's been very much sort of pushed underground. Um, in, uh, I'm giving away spoilers here, sorry, but yeah, he turns out to care. be a bad, <laughs> he, he turns out to be a bad guy, basically. Of course, yeah, a complete hypocrite, bad guy who's just manipulating people for his own gain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's the usually kind of cheesy story spin that you know, oh, they're only doing it for the money, that kind of thing, but. Yeah. 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 It, it I, is I an interesting a, movie. Yeah. yeah. I believe that's a huge part of the New World Order narrative is to have these uh reserves that are uh, resistant to their 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 plans, their mega city kind of smart grids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they anticipate this. They put it in all their programming. It's in uh, uh several things like the trailer of that movie, Surrogates, right at the end they had those uh anti robot reserves. And, and I noticed mm -hmm. that in uh, Brave New World, they have the Savage Lands. Yeah. Um, and in uh, a, AI. In um, that um, 2016 uh, um, World Economic Forum piece about uh, no privacy, no, don't own anything, but never been happier. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she talks about how she feels bad for those people that don't want to 
embrace the system and they have, they live on their little com communes and their low tech stuff. And it's just, a, it's a running theme. And I have, I'm going to do a whole video on that sometime when I get a chance. I think a little, a little bit like having, um, uh, this reference is some of the other stuff you were talking about with Jeff as well, like the boys from Brazil. It, it's a little bit like they want to have a copy or a, a batch of original uh, data that hasn't had all the alterations added to it. Is that to the control as, group? Yes, yes exactly. exactly. It's like a, it's a, a yeah. zoo. It's a zoo, a museum yeah. of a uh, human. I, I uh, couldn't think of that human. phrase, but yeah, that's exactly it. They yeah, want a I control believe, group. And I believe that's why they've they've pushed like YouTube channels like primitive technology and stuff, because they want to preserve mm -hmm. that old kind of, you know, living off the land kind of uh, mentality for people so they can learn that kind of skills and keep that. It's like a, a seed bank, you know, some kind of yeah. backup system. Yeah, and that they're not going to do it. Yeah, you know they they're not going to be the ones that dig in the dirt and build stuff back up from scratch. No, they want a little labor force that still knows those skills. And I believe yeah, so. they're actually building that right now. I, I'm, I'm uh, with the whole um, what's it called the greater reset. Yeah, that, that you pointed yeah. out, Camille, when you were pointing out mm. that uh, weird kind of thing with the that what's his name who's connected to both the UN and and is Lucius. also working with the greater reset. That was I mean, Stephen I, Brooks. I don't yeah. know if he knew, but you know who he's involved with. But yeah. well, that, that's one of the things you got to watch for with the NGOs is they are insidious. Yeah, and, and they will find a way in a similar fashion to like the article we were just looking at, where they're referencing how uh, monopolies like Facebook have basically been utilizing kind of like a chameleon methodology where they mold their presentation to attach to what they know people will find attractive. Uh, or maybe you could say like, uh, you know, other forms of camouflage in the natural world. They present themselves in, their, in a way that they know will be attractive to the intended audience, intended target. Yep. So in the same fashion, the NGOs present people uh, that they know will fit into that expectation you know so lo and behold he's his character who's representing all the ngos who is uh, attaching himself to this movement to uh, grassroots movement of genuine people that want to you know live outside the system or be more yeah. self-sufficient whatever whatever their reason yeah they want to be separate from all these agenda craziness that's happening like, yeah, exactly. And I, I want to make clear that I wasn't like accusing any of those people that are involved in the greater reset as being, you know, shills or anything like that. I think that they generally do want to, re, you know, have an alternative system to the horrible yeah. technocracy that is being formed in the major in the in the greater smart grid. So, but yeah. that one guy that I pointed to in the video, he does emphasize the that we need to focus on the genetics and everything like that. And there's so many like that plant a million trees or a billion trees. They're 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 putting out new des newly designed life. Like even that mm -hmm. is that the I can't even think of the name of the tree group, but they're they're bending that they they have to say that it's okay to put out the edited chestnut or whatever. It's okay mm -hmm. because well, we the, need it. <laughs> the GMO of mosquitoes. Yeah, 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 all the new things. They, well, they yeah, cannot yeah. they cannot know what the end result of affecting a biosphere like that will, will do. They they cannot predict it. And they, they may have put together these technologies using a lot of times the, the young minds that are in school, they tap them for the, the, the know-how, but then they get all of these people to participate by putting this stuff in the ground, you know, and all, well, all then it, the, the yeah. burden lays on them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all it takes is a, you know, one small ripple in the pond, a, a butterfly effect, wink, wink. And, yeah. Uh, we'll get mm -hmm. the chain rolling. You know, get the ball rolling and then have the chain reaction and then you'll just have to in order to fix the problem add more genetically modified things or gene edited things it just it was yeah. a snowball and then everything will be synthetic and then we'll have those reserves of the yeah. people that will preserve natural life yeah the control group yeah yeah, yeah. just in uh, case you know things go awry i, I do i do think there, there is definitely a lot of uh 
agenda narrative that's been added into that situation. But I'd, I'd also say that they, they consistently through history, they have done that tactic of attaching themselves to a genuine natural upsurge of energy in the public. So they know this kind of energy from the public swells up every so often. I, I'd say it's like every other generation, the, the crescendo of this energy builds up. And a little bit like solar cycles, over longer periods, there's bigger waves that build up. And they know that. So like the, um, the, the phrase of riding the tiger, they allow these sort of... Uh, side crops like you say like it, it is a control group but it's also like a um a, a safe bet you know it, it's a hedging bet they know that if their agendas don't go the way they want or turn out badly or something happens they've got this fallback position with these uh these other groups that they've allowed to exist you know you're not allowed to progress much and you're not allowed to you know uh, make any definite uh, pushback or competition to the dominance of the system, but you're allowed to exist. And not yeah. as modified. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I believe that they do realize that they need us, the conspiracy theorists, to uh, mm -hmm. fulfill this colony thing because we're the only yeah. ones that are going to be willing to do it because we don't want to live in their system. They know that. So they push us towards that all the time with their uh, yes. the algorithms constantly. Uh, I think the, um, I'll try not to get too uh, long-winded. It's a little bit esoteric, but there is an absolutely definite need that they have to have an opposition. Yes. The the methodology and their their I call it their their kind of like their religious attitude. They utilise division. They rely on a foundation that is uh, based on that principle of dual dualistic existence there has to be two there has to be two opposing sides because motion forward is not made without those two sides um bouncing off each other constantly you know, it's like your left right walking pace in the middle is your body whose imbalance is causing that friction between the two sides so you walk forwards yeah if that principle of dualism that is foundational to them means they cannot do what they do without an opposition. So they have to have some of us. This is the same reason why over the years I've, I've pointed out many times, you know, if you don't have an enemy, the system will create an enemy for you because this system doesn't know how to operate without that dualistic principle. So they, they have to allow a certain number of us, you know, I'm, I'm saying that loosely. I don't want people to feel like they're being corralled into some kind of group or whatever, yeah? But as a general, that general euphemism of us and them, you know, they, they have to have an opposition. They can't operate without it. So in a way, we even though it's to our, largely to our detriment, it's to our benefit to acknowledge that they have to operate that way. Yeah, that means there will always be some of us, even if we end up in smaller and smaller numbers, they have to allow a certain number of opposition. And maybe push them out into like the reservation, get them, get them out yeah. of the main area that in that one video I was talking about, where they were doing talking about the passports with that guy from India. And he was saying that as they, put their whole governmental system and everything on the machine that any form of resistance to a certain extent became increasingly harder to actually pursue over time. If you wanted to live mm -hmm. in their, in their part of society, because yeah. while it wasn't mandatory in the beginning, it was just, everything got moved there and you couldn't function. Yeah. That's the synthesis, the Hegelian synthesis. And it's what they, uh, rely on you know that steady gradual process and they don't to them it's not a concern whether it takes multiple generations for this stuff to happen that's the, like, the baby in slow yeah. play yeah. yeah but like you, you mentioned the reservation you know i recommend checking out the russell means video welcome to the reservation um you know it, that is the process they rely on create that division 
yes, you're allowed to exist as your separate little group because eventually your heritage, your lineage, your genetics, etc., will be absorbed through that process of synthesis over time. So you will be assimilated. To them, it doesn't matter if it takes 100 years because they plan 100 years at a time, you know? Yeah. And we've seen that steady progress since the, the last 200 years of that absorption of other cultural heritages, you know? They've been absorbed into this, what we now have, this global sort of conglomerate blob <laughs> of culture that's presented as modern culture, you know? They talk about cultural appropriation, and then that, that is literally the history of the world. <laughs> That's just what happens, right? That's the progress that happens. Yeah. And now they've got here in the States, there's all these old houses and poor people and people that haven't been able to pay their bills because they took away their they took away their jobs and their 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 opportunities to earn a living. And, and I saw a talk on the, the, one of the Clinton channels, they, they have their, Oh, they're so helpful to the world. And the, mm -hmm. the guy was talking about how their, their group's mission was to take people out of those old homes and put them in these nice new energy efficient, all electric, everything like your heat would be on a heat pump. Mm -hmm. It's like sewer don't lose power. <laughs> yeah, your sewer tube. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then, then that other that uh 10G thing where they're they're hardwiring the broadband, they're hardwiring the houses to be ready to run the those two hundred sensors and mm -hmm. gizmos that they want in in your home. And mm -hmm. yeah, how everything they'll just they'll move I, people. People will be so happy to leave their their leaking and and shack to get these nice new sewer tubes. Yeah. I, I, I thought the, uh, the last two or the last few videos you uploaded, the, the one about the, the smart home, you know, that 10G home. Yeah. And yeah. then um, I think it might have been the last one you uploaded about the microphone. Yeah. Uh, with the, what was it, something like 8,000 microphone points. I know, I know they're doing it digitally with the software. Yeah. But, the, the main point that came across to me, maybe it's my bias, is that I see this kind of thing stands out. It's like, so in other words, you can't stand at the other end of the room and have a quiet, whispered conversation with somebody that isn't picked up by the microphone. Yeah, they can analyze them all at the same time. They yeah. said all and the all same. of them can be hear, heard as clearly at the same volume across the room, no matter where people are standing or what they're doing. When I first heard about it, I wondered if it was just when there were four walls around you, you know, but then mm -hmm. one of the one of the articles that I showed on the screen showed the Calgary library and that was an opened up space and that the, but the bar was on the wall and they talked about it in one of the articles, how they yeah. were using that. But it, that someone pointed out in the comments, the, uh, in the comments of that, uh, no, of the, yeah, the microphone video that this is that poppy crumb her. It's like her dream. I have, I'm going to put it on to share. I want to show you the, mm -hmm. um, that poppy crumb, the video that I did a while back, the, the wireless earbuds to read yeah. and write your brain. Yeah, yeah. So poppy wants to get all kinds of that was the, there's that I put the this picture down here that I I scooped off of one of the articles she wrote and I have it open here, but all the different things that they can get from your from your ears with these hearables and what that tells them. But Poppy, I have another article here that she wants to build like the whole space. The walls can talk is the name of the one article that uh, she did for Wired magazine, which is terrible, but for the all of the elderly people that were in the care homes and everything that they were left to die or were or so totally isolated and what a horrible life it's the perfect lead into this new new world that they want to build where the the microphone mist being around you is great because how they could hear you if you were under the table you know if you landed on the floor in the corner with your face on the rug it was going to get you. It'll be able to find and hear what you're saying. But, um, but yeah, they, she's saying in this article how, and this was before this came out in February of 2020, you know, 
but they're talking about the uh, the that they'll be able to have the amalgamation of data from sensors that track proximity, CO2, your body's thermal dynamics, emotion, eye gaze, diameter, humidity, temperature, motion, light, pressure, ultrasound, microphones, and learning and gaining insight from those microphones. And uh, yeah, anyway, but they said that they'll see your the elders, all the, that they'll get to come and live in these new sewer tube homes or towers and that they'll be able to be autonomous and still be, still be healthy and, and cared for and be able to talk to whatever they're there. Was it Jibo? What was that one? Anonymous, you know, that one little, that one Which little one? robot, the robot, remember with the old oh. people? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I can't remember anyway, the name of it. I can't remember, uh, but yeah, they, they can get so much from us. And this goes to building your twin, you know, to have all of this, the readout mm -hmm. on your body, internal. That's what these things are getting from your ears. And I see people with them everywhere. Yep. It is just crazy. The people with these things and how they can tweak you. I don't know if you guys can see all that, what they say. Maybe yeah. I can make it bigger. Okay. I see that eye real clear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they, they say that the, just from your earbuds, they can tell who you're paying attention to, what calms you, you know, where your eyes are directed. All, oh, my goodness. It's crazy. But, oh, yeah. No, it's I remember just reading music. something. Yeah, I remember reading something a while back where they talk about a technology that could, like, analyze where your eyes are looking on the computer screen. So yeah. you know exactly what ads you're looking at and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, that must be, um, might maybe related to this. I don't know. Yeah. There's sure. some on there which, which really sort of stand out to me. So the brain electrical activity, because from that they can get a gauge on what parts of your brain you employ in so they can then uh, get an idea of what kind of emotion you're in, what kind of state of mind you're in possibly even to the extent of a, a general idea of what you're thinking about or what's preoccupying your attention. And then the skin resistance combined with the vagus nerve and the heart rate, that, that's physical manipulation. Yeah. You know, skin resistance is going to show sort of like the, the electrical body, basically. And from that, combined with the vagus nerve stimulation, uh, that, that's, yeah, that's quite uh, unsettling the concept of what they could potentially do to people via that. Oh, yeah, that taps your immune system, your mental yeah. health, you know, everything. And Poppy says uh, in the one in the video, she says that they they know they can do this and how they're working on what they want to do with it next. <laughs> you know, mm. And that that um, that in connection to the previous one you was just looking at, you know, the old people. If, if somebody reworded that article where instead of it being old people who need to be cared for, it's prisoners who need to be observed to make sure they're not making yeah. any attempt to escape, yeah. the article would be identical apart from those identifiers. Because mm -hmm. yeah, what they're describing here is the perfect system of imprisonment or nearly perfect system of imprisonment. When you combine that with the concept of the, the virtualized panopticon, you know, so it's not just when you're in your little cubicle box that they're monitoring you in this fashion. It is literally everywhere you go. And it's not only the physical environment, it's all the other people around you and the devices that they are carrying. Yep. You know, the, yep. This is basically describing a digitized prison system, but presenting it as being offered for the the good health of you you know because they care for you that classic excuse of we, we're doing it because we care for you and the thing i keep hearing is what well, it doesn't have a camera it has radar or lidar but it doesn't have a camera <laughs> <laughs> it can tell where you are what you're doing all these things you know and from all yeah. the other things that it can read off of you it knows right who you are but but there's no camera it's okay yeah, it, Honestly, it, I, I've got something I wanted to put together on lidar. I don't know if I'll get to it, but well, I, I was just I was just going to say it's only really that the the people in a security room, like watching monitor screens, that need a visual input. Yeah, yeah? digitized systems do not need the visual element. If anything, the visual element is problematic for a digital system to deal with. The software required 
to analyze and assess digital uh, visual content is a lot more involved and a lot more difficult than using all these other sensor systems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that that's a bit kind of like a what's the word for it? It's, it, it's a red herring. Yeah. You know, that that argument is a red herring in, in a similar fashion to the long held argument about them wanting to inject a microchip into you. Yes, it's possible. Yes, it's already commercially available. Yes, they are trying to encourage people to do that kind of thing, but they don't actually really need to. No, no, I'm, yeah. and I'm the, working the, on something on that too. The yeah. environment they're building around us or the environment that they're encouraging the public to build around themselves doesn't need a microchip injected into your body. To do all this kind of like to that example you're showing, yeah, just from the, the fact that they've encouraged everyone to start utilizing these earbud things because, oh, you know, it's so, so convenient. There's no wires and, oh, it's so wonderful. Everybody's doing it. And well, and I know that Poppy says that the ears are the window to the soul, but I wonder too how many of these readings they can get from the people wearing the Fitbits and the watches and things like that. Because I know they say the vagus nerve goes to your wrist too. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, combine it all together. Yeah, yeah. there's something else that over, over time you learn about how the system operates is they never choose one vector of attack. Uh, but, they do not rely on a singular vector of attack. They come from every angle they can. Did you guys see that new uh, thing that Google's coming out with the sleep surveillance little monitor that can sit on your desk? Yeah. And that way, you don't have to. You don't have yeah. to wear a Fitbit in bed anymore. So, yep, you can, yep. Just be you can wear your mask. And... <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. So, and there is um, what's it? There's digitally enabled masks now as well that will monitor your breathing and your CO two level and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And they have this uh, CRISPR technology that they had before or they talked about before the whole thing happened last year. But that is the Sherlock. I think it is that it's a that it's a, a CRISPR where it, if you breathe, you could put it in a mask so that you could have a visual um, that the cameras and things could could pick it up. But that it, it cuts it cuts something that that could make a chemical change or whatever to make like a, a different color or whatever the sherlock i have to yeah it's weird anyway so like the mask changes color depending on your yeah level it, or something yeah and it wasn't only for masks but the one thing i was saying was talking about it for masks it's I've amazing seen, oh hmm? i was just gonna say i've seen the the body responsive color changing clothing you know, it, cha it changes according to your mood, supposedly, but it, obviously it's based on temperature and again skin resistance. Yeah, so they're using the same kind of sensors to cause a, a color change in the clothing. I saw something. I'm opening it up right now. That uh, Gatorade, <laughs> which made me go idiocracy. But uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they made a patch. <laughs> It's drink got electrolytes. Yes. Yeah. It tells you how much you need to drink. It's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, ads. Sorry. Yeah. To, for, for me, part of the, the major problem with this kind of stuff is uh, similar to that first article I was showing. You know, it's, we could say there's a hell of a lot of usability and functionality and benefit potentially to get out of this kind of technology but when you add it into the patchwork of uh things that are being pushed forward it's nah. no you know i think the the cons very soon begin to outweigh the pros of the potential problems of this thing you know the fact that it, it's part of that uh digitized panopticon system it would be really useful to have some functionality like that. I don't think it's applicable to everyone, you know, but some people would find a good use out of a, a system like that, a technology like that. But to try and put it in with the rest of all this other stuff, uh, no. Nah. <laughs> I wouldn't do it really. If you're in that kind of 10G home 
and you're a pensioner like it was describing in that one article you know oh, we're building these homes to take care of the old people so that we know if they fell over and whatever i wonder if what they are commonly diagnosing as dementia is actually older people being driven insane by an environment that they feel is totally schizophrenic compared to their own sanity because for example you walk down the road and now you'll commonly see people walking mm -hmm. along talking to themselves yeah and if you were not so aware about some of the modern technology and this is what i'm referencing you know old people in a care home for example yeah if you're not so aware of a lot of modern technology you might feel that you're being encroached upon by this truly insane world because what the the tv is now talking to you since when can a tv talk to you? how does the tv know my name <laughs> you know for an older person who's not as aware of how the technology is very rapidly progressing it could make them feel like they are going insane when they they're not it's just that the environment is changing that much you know? and the pressure on your body from all these devices running all the time oh, yes. yeah. i i know also on that this we can google show the one lady who's the iot woman she has such bad migraines she gets botox shot botox shots in her forehead and for migraines and now i just heard her say that her 14 year old daughter also suffers from these horrible migraines it's like shut your stuff off <laughs> just yeah. take a break see if it helps yeah. oh my gosh go, 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 to a quiet zone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> go, go to a quiet zone experience at least three days minimum three days really you need several weeks for your body to reacclimatize back to normal but I, I suggest yeah. this is what I regularly Fantastic. say to Bill, yeah? go, go out into nature for a few days, at least preferably three days, put aside all your technology. You know, if you, if you need to have a phone or something with you for emergencies, but don't have it on all the time, leave it in your tent or in your hotel room or whatever, and just experience a few days away from all the technology because your body is under constant pressure from all these electrical magnetic fields, the EM smog. And, you know, walking uh, grass barefoot more often because it's called, yeah. it, it helps you rechannel with the Earth's grounding, they call it. So it's really yes. good for your body to, yeah. to reconnect that way. We put on shoes and stuff. It's like a filter that we don't really need. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Barefoot on the beach as well, barefoot yeah. through mud. Uh, be aware, though, of um, power power cable towers in your area or what are called gwen towers g-w-e-n oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah yeah because they affect the the current the current that is running through the grounds to quite a large area because they work on very low frequency so it travels quite far and that will basically negate <laughs> your beneficial grounding effect of being barefoot yeah so evil <laughs> yeah uh, the, the encroachment of that digital space requires a physical in infrastructure. You know, the system's quite happy to propagandize people in such a way that they don't really want you to think about, like, well, where are all the power cables for all this tech? Where's the power being generated? How are they generating the power, et cetera, et cetera? Uh. Yeah, I'm gonna, before I shut the little screen share thing off, let me say, it, it blows me away because all of the, all of, oh, if we didn't have the tech in this whole event from last year, oh, how disconnected we'd be. I, I hear that stupid argument all the time because it's like that so much of it came pushed out of like all the fear and everything out of the, the tech industry. I know I showed that in a video where the, they were pushing the no handshakes. They were pushing the, mm -hmm. the, Oh, we should stop traveling. And then I saw, um, you know, the video I, I did on the, with the, all the mayors saying the same thing, like the news mm -hmm. repeaters. Yeah. So that on that same channel, that Bloomberg phil philanthropies, this, uh, she, she yeah okay. the, uh, the mayor, yeah the mayor of of san francisco she this video is called uh on why she initiated the first major lockdown in the u.s it's like of course of course that's where it would stem from it's just uh but there's right. nothing to see there even though tech is taking over every aspect of life 
What would we do without it? A nice deep blue colored top on there as well. Uh, uh, blue being that water element, water element being a major part of some of the esoteric uh, gambits that they've been running for the last, oh, I don't know, decade plus. Yeah. I keep seeing all this brave new ocean stuff coming out of like mm -hmm. uh, with the economist and things like that. They, yeah, that all the, this is the decade of the ocean. I haven't yeah, looked too much waves. to see what they're doing. Yeah, the waves. Yeah, this is something that myself and Jeff were both sort of talking about in 2019. All through 2019, there was this subtle undercurrent, you know, pun intended, there was this subtle undercurrent of constantly pushing the element of water yeah, in in a, in a logos sense, as in the element of water was being attached to every subject matter possible, every concept that they were talking about, every ideological argument being made. There was element, the element of water was being brought in in one way or another. And you look at the the sustainable development goals. You know, and what what is the according to general science anyway for a carbon based life form? What is the most intrinsic thing required water h2o toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> that's only in a pandemic though <laughs> oh, no. people poo themselves more in a pandemic so they need extra toilet paper but yeah it, i was it, just it, reading uh, reading a headline on the uh, new york times or i think it was mm -hmm. new york times oh new york post sorry uh, suez canal ship crisis may lead to worldwide toilet paper shortage so uh, be aware the ship that's caught and stuck Dude. in the Suez Canal. Yeah, it's a perfect the, the race HRC. to use the, use the Arctic routes. That's the it's shorter yeah. and it'll be green. I had that thought. I had that yeah. thought when they were talking about it being clogged up. I remembered your uh, Arctic Channel or uh, Canal video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That took a while to spit out. <laughs> but yeah. It's, it, Anyways, I'm on. thinking as well, it's, it, it makes a good excuse for them when their economy is crashing and supply chains be, are becoming or have been interrupted. Now they've got like a really clear, visible justification to present to the public of like, oh, why have all, why is all the shipping stopped? Why is the, the supply chain falling apart? Oh, well, it's, look, it's because this tanker that got stuck. Yeah, and they can use that excuse. It will also help uh, alleviate the argument or the question that hasn't been asked much for the last few months, but it, it sort of come up last year about, well, if we can't, if we're going to restrict international air travel, then shouldn't we also be restricting international freighter travel? For example, those tankers that come through the Suez Canal. Oh, there sure. Is. And they want everything to be produced locally, everything yeah. come out of your vat locally, you know, to make yeah. all the products, everything, even your phone, your new phone, they want to make come out of a vat. Yeah. Yeah. It could, yeah. It could also lead to uh, an opportunity for them to make more use of that scarcity principle and claim that, you know, oh, well, if you, if you're good people, if you're good little citizens, and you go out and get your jumpy jab, then we'll allow you access to this uh, warehouse supply of, uh, you know, the latest phone from um, from Taiwan or whatever. You know, that because the the supply chain has been interrupted, there's only so many units in the UK. But you're a good citizen, and you've got the certificate, so therefore you're allowed to buy one. I'm waiting for it to come out that the stuck ship got stuck because the guy driving it, maybe he had COVID and he coughed <laughs> and knocked the controls or something. And they'll be I'm playing. hearing it was a female captain. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, I don't know if they, have they removed that art. Oh no, it's just timed out. Um, I was going to share one of these other articles that, Phenonymous sent over. Um, I haven't had the time to read all of this one. Um, this is the one you sent out. Uh, how the chaos of 2020 will shape the next decade, according to eight design experts. Right. Uh, yeah. The one with that will crave foods that haven't been invented yet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yep. Uh, Get your your mastodon meat with 
eagle <laughs> eggs and all kinds of <laughs> yeah. yeah extinct meats yeah yeah um, soylent your, green flavored ice cream oh your nacho favorite bananas just like in uh the sixth day in the beginning uh the little girl officer dead do you want original oh, yeah. or natural flavored banana? Oh. Yeah, yeah. And your celebrity cheese. You can get that too, yeah. Oh, oh no, <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow's cheese. Yeah, it, well, uh, Ellen DeGenerate too, yeah. Uh, 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 that, that's just unpleasant. Anyway, <laughs> so, yeah, on this article, I'll read this one out. It, it, it's, as it says in the title, it's eight sort of comments from experts in their field. But I'll read this one. We will cry foods that haven't been invented yet. The food system is broken and people are starting to realize it. By 2030, people won't need to be convinced that sustainable food choices are better. It will be obvious and frankly the only choice. The production of food from animals will be well understood as extremely inefficient and unnecessary. Plant-based meats will have been invented that are better on every metric, more delicious, less expensive, better for our health. <laughs> this is going to be difficult to read oh. without laughing. And people will choose to eat these foods regardless of whether or not they care about the environment. Wow. That's just like, yeah, you're going to have no choice. Yeah, Sorry, I'll stop interrupting. More and more people, especially young people, will begin to view eating animals as something completely prehistoric. Not only will all meat come from plants, but I imagine many other types of sustainable foods will have been invented that are better for our planet and healthier for people. Crops will start to become optimized for human consumption rather than as food for the animals that we eat today. We will create new and diverse food textures, flavors, and aromas that people crave. <laughs> we'll likely have entirely new categories of food that don't even exist yet. In fact, I think many industries will experience similar transformations since most of them are broken from an environmental standpoint. People will not stand for this anymore. They will no longer choose to consume and use products that destroy the planet. We will change what we eat, what we wear, what we drive, and how we travel. And because of that, we'll have a bit more greenery in the world. Yay. That's from Yay. Giselle Guerrero, <laughs> Vice President of Creative Impossible Foods. Right. <laughs> Food as software. Yeah, seriously. And be. they've already... They've already democratized it. They've already sent the the tools out there so everybody around the world can have all this roll out at the same time. You know, yeah. I wonder, because you look at uh, that Just company with Josh Tetrick, the guy that uh, yep. they've got the Singapore, the lab grown meat, they rolled it out there first. But, mm -hmm. um, but or so they say, because didn't Israel also? I don't know, I don't know. But, mm -hmm. um, but, they talk about their stuff like their their just egg and everything, and I can't say for sure what how much actual plant uh, extracts pieces of plants actually end up in these things. If they're just using the synthetic biology, like for the flavors and the the properties of scrambling like an egg, but I have to wonder when they're like, oh, it comes from mung beans because that other. The other company that it's a spinoff of that Amaris that uh, the video that this is what synthetic or sustainably produced looks like um, that I I showed I, I jumped in that that chat on there the the squalane the squalane video they they push their that biosense they push their product saying that it's made from pure sugar cane but I have them saying that they feed the sugar cane to the microbes, you know? Mm -hmm. So is that what all of these other base, you know, it's mung bean based, it's soybean based, like, and they tweak these plants. They said in the, and that uh, the, with the Amherst people, the, this is what uh, sustainably produced looks like that they, they tweak the plants to make them better microbe food to bring out these things that they want. But uh, mm -hmm. so I, I do genuinely wonder they said, uh, are there any mung beans in there? <laughs> or, did, or did the microbes eat them? Trace yeah. elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's really also a little, that, that kind of spinnery again as well, because you're not really eating the mung bean, you're eating the poop of the bacteria that yeah. ate the mung bean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my gosh. Does, right. 
microorganisms. I just, I just wanted to pull this one out because for me, we might kind of, you know, uh, eye for looking for logical mistakes, you know, logic, illogical conclusions. Whatever. Crops will start to become optimized for human consumption rather than as food for the animals that we eat today. Uh, hang on a minute, mate. You're telling me that the food you're giving to the animals is not good enough quality for a human to eat. Hmm. Considering we eat the animals, that means what the animals are eating should also be of a high quality because we're going to eat that animal. So you just told me, which, you know, pretty much obvious knowledge now these days, most people know that the the mass food industry that produces most of the meat products is feeding the animals crap. Yeah, you know, well, they feed them the absolute crap, man. They yeah. feed yeah. them, like, uh, a lot of uh, candy-making companies will, because they'll have, like, defect products, and they'll ship them off to the farms, and they'll feed the cattle and all Wrapper that. Wrapper and all. Wrapper and all, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the the other thing is it, it's it is kind of a little bit circular it's kind of like a, a circular argument because the animals are part of the food we eat so saying that crops you know which is a food stuff that we eat so both of those things are referencing things that we already eat and if they're saying the crops will start to be optimized for human consumption then in the same fashion, the animals are also optimized for human consumption. So the whole argument is a little bit circular. You know, so an animal is a, a, a food stuff. So therefore, the animal should be optimized for human consumption as well. Oh, sure. And they yeah. introduced the cloned meat was how long ago Obama, the, yeah. at least here, it was approved A-OK. -okay. And yeah. the, the the general sort of... Uh, uh, preposition, I suppose, maybe, maybe not, whatever. The the sort of suggestion, because uh, this is sort of targeting young people. You know, young people will begin to view eating animals as something prehistoric. Oh, yeah. In other words, all meat eaters, all carnivores, or really should strictly say omnivores, because people are omnivores, not carnivores. You know, the, the, uh, the concept is archaic, such that it would be considered prehistoric. So if you want to be in with the new crowd, with the trendy crowd, with the now happening crowd, then you've got to forgo any meat consumption because that's prehistoric. You're a dinosaur. Yeah, eat yeah. these new garbage products that are coming out from the same corporations that brought the monster of the food system that we have. Yeah. You know, they win again. And it's, this time it'll be better, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're systematically wiping out farming operations all over the world just to make it yeah. tougher and tougher to grow meat at all for yeah. sure. farmers. You know, so yeah. wiping out chicken flocks so that whenever there's you know, a, a mention of an outbreak of uh, bird flu, then they're wiping out whole flocks just as a precaution thing. So it's just, it's just, it's uh, not okay. good. <laughs> so they can put some of those Chromec machines in in all of the the chicken facilities that are monitoring the air constantly, and they'll know the second, and they can just kill the whole. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, reading way back about a farmer. He just uses oregano oil as a you know preventative for diseases in his chicken flock. Now that's not sustainable. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just got done rereading the, or not rereading this time. It was the first time I read uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle mm -hmm. with the meat. Have you guys read that? With the, no. the Oh my gosh, it was horrible. So it's like, a, what, a hundred years ago and it's supposed to be the, the, how the meat packing and how, how disgusting it how all of the, the diseased animals and that this brought about so many reforms in the, mm -hmm. the animal welfare. And like they cleaned out the drains and put it in the sausage and all this awful stuff. And you know what the cure for, sorry, spoiler, what the cure for everything awful that capitalism brought in, not just like this uh, uh, corporatocracy mm -hmm. sort of thing, but what the cure socialism. Mm -hmm. That was the way to save everybody. It, well, it, is, unfor yeah. it is unfortunately one of the things. It's almost always attached to the argument. So they'll they'll claim that they initially begin their argument or you know their protestation is oh we we care about the animal welfare. Look at all this terrible stuff that's happening. We want to care for the animals, they and don't. then they want to tell you about their their socialism or their communism kind of collective ideology. 
You know, so hang on a minute, mate. I thought you were saying you care about the animals, but now you're trying to convince me of the uh, sort of geopolitical argument. <laughs> Which is it? Are you here for the animals or politics? Yeah. yeah. But it's, the, it's a common thread that's been pushed, uh, I suppose, I'm not that uh, 100% on some of the history of this, but <clears throat> isn't it something that stemmed out of a lot of that political uh reformation through the 50s and 60s a sort of rise of, of the communist ideologies i know it stretches back a lot yep. further than that uh 69 i think the the socialism had an uprise you know in the yeah. west but it was quelled yeah. pretty quickly in but it seems to and all that stuff too it coincides with that um attitude of uh, i'll say veganism but you know it's not strictly just veganism per se it's just that um animal welfare concern more than anything you know it, it did seem to sort of spark off a lot in the in the 60s and get pushed and deliberately attached to that politicized mm -hmm. ideology or political. anything with an ism isn't really a good idea <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. You have your personal diets, that's great, but if you're joining an ism, then you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. And I stopped being vegan uh, about a year ago because I just freaking hate the New World Order so much, and I know that they're taking meat away, so it's like, you know, screw you, I'm just going to eat it to, to defy you. <laughs> it, do, it does seem to be, and I know there's a very long-running argument, and there's people, there's good arguments on both sides of this debate, you know, and there's a lot of experts throwing it at each other constantly but it, i feel there is a good argument to be made that part of mankind's development has been geared with meat consumption you know that yeah, high sure. protein high fat consumption was part of what helped us i say helped us but it was part of what added into our development up to where we are now so there's a lot about what we are that wouldn't be there without meat consumption and part of yeah. that is that um the physicality of it you know the, there's an element of them uh, this as well was why i was questioning whether this stretches back to like the the communist revolution things like that there's that element of starving the general populace so that they can't be strong enough to put up a fight when you send in tyrannical forces to take over. Yeah, well, it even goes back to like the Nazi regime. They were yeah. pushing less meat in like local farms and all that stuff too. Yeah, they were pushing it, the same kind of commie ideas. Yeah, I mean, Hitler uh, was a vegetarian. Yeah, and uh, with the whole diet thing, I mean, uh, it was a lot different back in cave times or whatever because um, you didn't have access to things like quinoa and all the high protein things you can get now on a <laughs> yeah. vegan diet. But I mean, I felt really good on a vegan diet and I like vegan diets and I also like meat. So I don't really, it's like whatever you want to eat as good as long as you're eating it like whole foods, natural foods, um, you know, organic. Yeah. Not getting for your people fat you trust. From, not from those, uh, the dip and dots formed fat yes. or <laughs> brewed yeah. up fat globs to put in your molecular equivalent. Exactly. Yeah, Frankenstein yeah. foods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even the whole food diet is where it's at. Yeah, that you could Whatever actually you grow yourself. Yeah, not just yeah. pure. <laughs> I've grown pure. quinoa before. It's fun. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Isn't it quite? Uh, it's it's quite energy intensive, isn't it? In the sense of it takes a lot to grow and uh, sift compared to the. Oh, it's, no, the, it's not the, that hard to grow, but. Uh, it would be a kind of a pain in the ass to sift through. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Is for, like the energy return of it, it's quite intensive. Uh, how much you have to do to get, actually get the energy return from it? It was actually the in Canada the the crop of the year in I think 2013 because it grew oh. so well here. Yeah. Uh, and we grow lentils so well that we ship to India. So suck it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Uh, I, want to, I, I want to give this article a quick mention as well. 
Oh, wait, yeah. one other thing. Sorry, back on that other article mm -hmm. before you go away. Yeah. I, I it was not on the food thing, but I saw, uh, I think it was in there, the coronavirus fundamentally redesigned our health journey map, which is such a load of crap. You know, I saw videos from before any of it started. They were at events. I, I don't have it ready, but they were talking all about the their shift to the telemedicine and all that, how they everything was lined up and in place and ready to go. So it's like yeah. there was no shift. Yeah, it's just pushing yeah. along the same way. So. They say, um, I think I found it, I'll go back to it in a sec, but I was going to just look at the one that was about education, because I think they pretty much say the same about the education, yeah. The yeah. learning pods, you know, and them talking about using Zoom classes and whatever, and, you know, children being uh, put into kind of like remote learning pods. Uh, in people. the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Growing like, little pod children. When you're done looking at this, I, I shared a link in the private chat there about uh, the inventor of the World Wide Web. He also wants to create a pod thing. It sounded interesting. Uh, I didn't read through it all day. Is that, the, is that a sort of a clumpy sort of thing like that? Uh, I think that was the word clumpy, maybe. But that Ben Gertzel that he's talking about how if we would be okay if we all lived in communities where, you know, you didn't, that 15 minute thing, right? Where you don't mm -hmm. go too far from home and you're, that well, you get hurt. Yes. I, yeah. He oh, was, yeah. They're building that in this city. My city, they I, want 15 minute communities. It works with their uh, driverless agenda. You know, they want everything reachable by bicycle or walking or, you know, probably share ride or autonomous vehicle, whatnot. Because there's a store there and you can go to that store in your neighborhood and you don't need to go anywhere well, else. You, you yeah. can't because you don't have, you're not wearing a mask. You don't have your vaccination. So I guess you're screwed. Exactly. Well, uh, no, you could have a, what was it? They call it a and, powered and, and you air purifying respirator helmet. Yeah. Also, you can't go to the next community over because there's only one corridor and that's going to be, you know, blocked off by military or police force. Geofenced, yeah. You won't be able to get through. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that appears in the, the mega cities on the move, the community city scenario. Mm -hmm. not, not planned off as the community city scenario where the, uh, the V character is talking about how her community is doing a vote whether or not they want to link up with the laborhood. And because they have, it's, it's, it's so nuts. Oh. And that was in 2009. It's actually 2010, I think. It's almost like they plan these things. It's, no, no, no. That's going no. You're, you're talking like a conspiracy theory. So you need to uh, control yourself. What is wrong with me? You need to eat some soil and green because you're not feeling well. And put my earbuds yeah. in. Yeah. 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 Yep. Right. I'm guessing this is what you've stored on your archive from the New York Times. He created the web, but now he's out to remake the digital world. Tim Berners-Lee wants to put people in control of their personal data. He has technology and a startup pursuing that goal. Oh, can he succeed? Well, he might if he took his hand out his pocket. <laughs> yeah, because if you're in control, if each person is in control of, of their personal everything, then like the responsibility of if you're using out-of-date gizmos or anything to track mm -hmm. your health, it all falls on you, Yeah, not on the manufacturers, because that's one of their who's in charge, who's to blame if there's a problem. Yeah, I think it, it's quite fitting as well that it's him yet again that he's sort of initiating the transition for the general public of going from the current technology that's been implemented into the new version of the same technology. Because yeah? what he's talking about is a kind of decentralized, almost like mesh network system or blockchain system. And like I said, in a similar fashion, he's the face on the transition that is already taking place anyway in the same fashion as back in the 90s, like he's credited as inventing the World Wide Web. He didn't. The internet was already in existence and already doing its thing. But what he helped to get instituted, he didn't directly create it on his own. What he helped to get instituted was the, the general protocol of the HTTPS, or HTTP, back then, before the security extra. You know, the HTTP, uh, system, the protocols that meant the majority of the internet all operated on the same protocol. Therefore, you had a kind of unifying format that everybody adhered to on their web pages. So 
your computer could understand what the different web pages were saying because it's all coming through the same uh, scripting language. So he didn't invent the World Wide Web, but he did act as a face for a transition that was already taking place at the time because the internet had proved itself to be popular enough that they wanted to implement it as an integral part of society. Most of the big businesses were getting onto the internet. E-commerce was what it used to be called back then. And it was really, you know, it was the bubble. It was the e-bubble. Yeah. And that was, that meant that all those different uh, interest groups who had an interest in being on the internet for one reason or another realized that they needed to organize their protocols on the internet so they could have that uniformed format. So that was all that it was already happening before he came along and said, Oh, I've got this thing called uh, HTTP. Oh, yeah, we could have the World Wide Web. So in the same fashion, he's doing the same thing now. That is a weird picture. <laughs> What's up with his hand? What and the fact doing? that he's got the, the tree behind him. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some subtle psychological connotations with that. You've got the wilderness of the, the bushiness behind him, but he's the solid tree. Yeah, like the, the looks like he, had a, he has a gunshot to his admin or something. <laughs> it looks like he's been shot and he's up against a tree yeah. <laughs> holding his admin. But the, I don't know all the details of what he's actually suggested, but I've looked at some of it over the past several, it's been more than several months he's been talking about this, but it is very similar to that kind of decentralized mesh network style blockchain system that means like you mentioned earlier yeah it's going to be the individual so you're going to be individuated in your web experience you know um, it gives you a little bit more power and functionality about how your chosen uh, operating system or browser or software moves around on the internet but at the same time, it means you're going to be in that situation where the um, responsibilities for the control of your data become much more amorphous. You know, the responsibility would end on you if it's anything to do with legal culpabilities. But as for the responsibility of a, a company like Facebook, no, that, that just gets vanished into the cloud of this uh, decentralized um, blockchain system. You know, I, Facebook is just a platform, mate. They're not to blame. It's you, the individual. You're supposed to be in charge and responsible for what's happening. And then all the addicted users, they'll want the newest gizmo. They'll want the updates. Yeah. They'll have to have it because it's it's their, yeah. their business. Yeah. Well, you know, Honeycomb is made of individual pods, but it all mm -hmm. is together in one as a hive. Yeah. Making so, up a big you know, web, a web a network. Big, yep, and everyone's in their little pod, their B pod. Uh, it strikes me as a little bit similar as well to that story I was just going to mention, because although he's, you know, he's not exactly got that much hair left, but he does have somewhat blonde hair. You know, it's like a, a very light brown, almost blonde color. I think he might have been blonde when he was younger. But it's just making me, you can't see the picture of him there, the Trump one. Because Trump was the other golden-haired one, you know. And in a similar fashion, he's talking about setting up his own social media platform. <laughs> ah, nice segue. <laughs> well, as well, it reminds me of what we were saying earlier about the, the surrogates movie and that kind of storyline. You know, there, there has to be an allowance for the opposition. There has to be an opposition. So the fact that he's talking about setting up a social media platform of his own, it's like, yeah, it's, it's another uh, ring within the circus. You know, you used to have a three ring circus. Soon you're going to have a four ring circus because uh, he's going to set up his own uh, platform for doing his thing on. Yeah. All this going at the same time as we've got the technological changes, such as the kind of stuff that, Tim Berners-Lee has been talking about. They try to get everyone to join the hive, you know, be part of the hive, but then they also 
talk all about how, oh, the bees are dying, you know, all the stuff yeah. that we're doing, it's killing. It's like, join, be a bee, <laughs> be a good little worker bee. You won't die. I forgot I haven't put the link for this in the chat. So one sec. And then the one main other thing I wanted to mention, we've got a bit more time to sort of get into it a little bit, but it is a fairly big topic. So I knew we wouldn't have enough time to really sort of go majorly in depth on this. Uh, it needs a few episodes, I think, if people really wanted to dig into all of this stuff. And this is the Spars Pandemic document uh, from the John Hopkins Center for Health Security. And I'll scroll down to the main one that I just wanted to pull out because I said there's, there's quite a lot to this. And when you really start sort of pursuing the threads of this thing, you could spend quite a few hours. And I know this is something that many people have done in recent times. And we sort of talked about this document, uh, this project a few times before. Um, and I know... Taz has usually got the link for this as well that often gets shared in the chat room. So I just dropped it in again for this PDF. Yeah, the Spars Pandemic, uh, what do they call it, project? or uh, Futuristic Scenario for Public Health Risk Communicators. This was a wargaming uh, virtual scenario of a pandemic outbreak, which they dubbed spars um i'm not sure if i think that's an acronym for something or acronym sorry for something um uh saint paul uh something acute respiratory syndrome yeah that's usually what the ars oh, is yeah yeah because it's like sars and whatever isn't it? it's the same thing yeah just the drop the p in it and it's your name yeah uh, rather than being spars, it's sars. It's a bit like the Stephen King, what was it, Captain Trips? Yeah, Captain Trips illness or whatever. But anyway, the, this one section, possible future in 2025, the echo chamber. And this is talking about how they were well aware of how the public would respond and how uh, communication, as they would call it, you know, via the media and between the authority groups like their medical experts, their scientists and politicians and all that kind of, kind of stuff, <coughs> how it would affect the communications between them and the public and how the public would react. <coughs> and there's a lot in this of how they um, wargamed. You know, they talk about building a matrix, a scenario matrix has been constructed. This is game theory. Yeah, they're using game theory to calculate probabilities on a matrix of the, well, as they describe it as levels of fragmentation among populations along social and political, religious, ideological and cultural lines. And it's also in reference of like the ability to access information and the media as it's conveying the message that they want the, the public to get. You know, there's so much in just this one project. So we've often mentioned the event 201. And like I said, we, we have mentioned this one as well a few times. But when we're talking about how they are uh, on the surface, on the, the general appearances on the main media, the mainstream media, the politicians have been giving out this kind of, oh, we're not sure yet what we're going to do kind of attitude, you know, that kind of uncertainty that, oh, we might introduce passports or we might only introduce them for certain things or we might do it this way or that. These uncertainties are them putting out trial balloons test uh, to test the public's reaction. And in Event 201, they, they covered it with what they defined as the infodemic and in this one they're talking about the echo chamber but they're both addressing the same point how do they control the information and the communication via the media and how do they deal with the general public's reaction 
Yeah. Uh, I'll put a link in for this. In. You know that uh, alternative media platform they have on there called Zap with the Q at the end? That kind of makes me think of the whole Trump social media that's being built. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Has a Q, Zap with is, a Q? What? Yeah. Yeah, and, and this document is in, is 2017, by the way, and that's when uh, Q started. Oh. The image is blue. Sorry, I was just noticing in the chat. Um, the image at my end looks okay. It looks clear enough to read. So, yeah, like uh, Krishna Krishna said in the chat, check your resolution settings because it should be clear enough. It's a little small. Uh, I can or should be able to zoom it in a bit. There you go. But it's it's the resolution, the definition of each letter. That's the thing. If you only seen the video in a very low resolution, then yeah, it would just become a blurry mess. Um, I'll put the link in the sidebar as well. I highly recommend grab yourself a copy of that and read it. Uh, have a look through it. Um, it. Give you an indication that yet again. All these claims that a lot of what has occurred over the last year have been totally unexpected and they weren't planned for. They had no Ooh. plans of how to deal with this kind of thing already written and complete and utter hogwash. It's quite so, hilarious because they have not only this scenario, they have the one after it was Clay X in 2018. In 2019, they have Event 201 and I believe also in 2019 was red contagion which was a scenario made by uh, specifically the city of chicago right. and yeah they just got a whole bunch of these things so i mean like you're not prepared but you've been <laughs> you've been tabletop yeah. this forever so i mean like come on <laughs> yeah. you want us to believe you don't know what to do there's elements in this as well where you know they make it obvious that a lot of their concern is having um access to people's information you know, your data and in effect track and trace even though they don't sort of call it that in this um but it's the same kind of point oh is that the one you mean the zap Q, a platform yeah, that enables that's the users to aggregate and archive selected media content from other platforms and communicate with cloud based social groups based on common interests and current events you know, you can tell it's an academic document because they write massively long sentences without any punctuation in whatsoever. Yeah, I also think it's interesting they talk about this group called this this super anti-vaccine group at, at the at, like further down in the article. They, it's like, <clears throat> I don't know. I just thought it was really interesting. They, 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 this like big merger of like four different groups of anti-vaxxer groups into this one super group. They were anticipating for like uh, I think it was. 2028 20, or something, or 20, I don't remember which year it was in their 25 or 28 that. scenario. I did look through it months ago, but I can't remember hardly any of it. So I'll have to read it again at some point. If you just use the find a word, you could just like type in super anti vaccine group or, or is it anti vaccine super group? I can't remember which phrasing it is. Yeah, because these are vaccines they use right not gene therapies or or anything else who knows there's therapeutics there. there there is a like a kiwanis kiwanis or something like that koalas koalas sorry i can't say the word it's like redenosvir but but with a k kwasavir or something like that that's their big uh, uh therapeutic treatment for the condition and the sparse thing yeah Okay. Yeah, that's their version of the therapeutics they were talking about in uh, this event that they're <laughs> currently experiencing. This scenario. Oh, yeah, so it gets into the possible cures. It's a fairly long read. I was like going through it all this morning, just listening to it. Yeah. Uh, I will read that at some point. But. Yeah, we don't have to go through it. I just, I just wanted to talk mainly about the echo chamber. It was the only thing I was really interested in. Yeah, time because we were talking about the digital gulag. Yeah, that's what I thought was the, the most relevant. And you, you said that. Yeah. So yes, they did cover exactly the same points. And that was mm -hmm. 
2017, yeah, to all these claims that this is not something they're working towards. Again, the easiest way I can describe it is just hogwash. Yeah, it's like leftover swill water that you don't really want. <laughs> Maybe they can grow it in a lab somewhere and potentially turn it into something. I'm sure they will. Yeah, give it some mouth feel, you know. <laughs> <laughs> some it's texture. cheap, tasty, and affordable. Yeah. yeah. And bulk it out, put it in a happy meal. Oh. Job done. Yeah, in this uh the what what's your bio strategy, how to prepare your business for synthetic biology book that I have by one of the authors is that guy from the Synbio Beta, the John Cumbers who writes for Forbes all the time in the section where they're talking to uh, Craig Manter. He said that they're advocating for changing the definition of food, you know, that the flavor world can provide flavors and texture world can provide textures. It's like, oh, that's not even food. Of course, that's redefine the word right mm. anyway sorry Ew. just turn all the food into a pill and i'll just swallow it and get over with me <laughs> just such a, don't make me eat your mouth feel yeah <laughs> i don't well, want gotta to have you have the ice cream <laughs> uh, yeah at least in the future there is ice cream i don't want yeah. your masters on steaks no thanks <laughs> bill oh, gate right. burgers yeah made to taste like bill gates <laughs> ew <laughs> I had forgotten to put that up at the start on the banner, but there you go. <coughs> oh, yeah. Ice oh, cream yeah. for you and you scream for me. Ice cream for everyone. Ice cream socially. Yeah. I think the, that agenda of attempting, and I'll keep reiterating the point, you know, I'll keep adding those adjectives to make the point that it is not a conclusion yet. They have not succeeded yet. They obviously want to, and they want to give the public the impression, the perception that they have already exceed, succeeded, and it is a, a done deal, and you know, that's it. You've got no choice. It's inevitable. The reality is a big reason for all these media campaigns and these media spin stories to attempt to trick you into going along with this crap is because they haven't actually succeeded yet. It is not over you still have choice and you can still influence or walk away from all of this crap that they're trying to put on uh, in front of you to present to you the digital gulag has its gates wide open at the moment and they're playing a lot of uh, propaganda from the the road the, the loudspeaker you know the radio output i was talking about with that first article you know the radio they use that to push their propaganda in the same fashion now they're using the internet. The gates are wide open. You don't have to walk in. And it could totally backfire. There's stuff with like, oh, you can't go to the grocery store if you haven't had your shot. Your shots. Not that it's necessarily there yet, but don't go to the grocery store. Before was the time to establish a relationship with your farmers, but now it's like it's imperative. If you don't, you know. And, and it's the going reason, to come out of a bat. <laughs> there, there are beneficial ways that collectivism, I know that's a triggering word for many people, but there are beneficial ways collectivism can help you and help this situation. You know, collectivism does not mean following a political ideology like socialism or communism or Marxism or whatever. Collectivism just means working together in groups. You know, it doesn't mean you're absorbed into that group and lose yourself and your own self-identity and autonomy or whatever, not at all. It's free association. So little little community groups that are growing their own food, little farming collectives and co-ops, all these kind of things are systems that have again and again and again proved themselves over the course of time to be beneficial in surviving and living through major periods of change in the world and maybe i should say periods of major change because that's what's happening at the moment so you know don't throw the baby out with the bath water just because something uh, has that kind of grouping or collecting collective i should say collective kind of element to it doesn't mean it's all bad it doesn't mean you can't work with other people because that means you're part of a group oh no a group 
some of this stuff is best addressed by working in unity with other people, standing shoulder to shoulder. You know, a shield work wall only works when you stand shoulder to shoulder. <coughs> you can't pre present as good a defence if you all split up and stand in different places on the battlefield. You know? Yeah, right. Exactly. You have your own little wolf packs. <laughs> yeah. The little tribes, man. Yeah. Stick or your own little freedom cells. Yeah. Uh, yeah in a exactly. in in very much a similar way to the kind of decentralized me mesh networks and blockchain technology software that they're now you know putting out there. In the same fashion, that applies to people and your population, your society. You know, people can work in little groups and interact with each other, free association with each other, and that enables the the larger, the macro processes of society to carry on. They don't need a centralised organising bureaucracy to dominate it all. Uh, our roots are tribal. We're not solitary animals or solitary yeah. beings, I should say. Yeah. Uh, something i think is a, a major fundamental part of what they're trying to mess with and they're trying to make people forget all of that and only be concerned with their individuated little uh window from their box a little window on the world through which that system pumps its propaganda narrative bullshit yeah you know, see the whole world through their lens yeah yeah that's a good way of describing it yeah uh, the prism is the prism that they give you to be your prison. Uh, if you keep looking through their prism, P-R-I-S-M, then all you ever see is that prism, P-R-I-S-O-N. So you'll be a prismer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a prismer. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if we wrap it up there, we've just gone past the hour. So hopefully I know you've got to get off soon. Um, and I'll yeah. say like I did last time hopefully we'll come back at some point in the not too distant future and do another one uh, we've got no set date yet we will organise it as and when but hopefully it won't be too long um, thanks again for joining in guys thanks for running the chat room yeah, thank I'm you sorry. Cookie I'm sorry I didn't really read much of the chat tonight I was too busy slacker <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at that kind of multitasking because I don't like to only give half attention to something, especially with a chat room, because then you get the wrong end of the stick too often. You know, you, you're trying to read comments that are part of somebody's longer conversation and you only get one bit of it. You know? it's, it's similar to how the government likes to give you little snippets of the truth and not the whole truth. Yeah, yeah we'll it's too hard. Yet. I, I don't even... I don't even go live anymore. I just record on, just do like a live recording and then just post it because it's just too distracting. Plus, my setup sucks. So, mm -hmm. combination yeah. of the two. <laughs> well, we're reliant on this technology uh, as and much they allow us to still do it. Uh, we will carry on. Well, I certainly will. I shouldn't pre presume oh, yeah. for everyone else, but. Yeah, I'm never leaving the mainstream platforms until they completely remove me. Because, uh, I mean, just like even Jeff C. himself, he believed that you got to stay on the platforms where everyone else is. You can't go into your own yeah. echo chambers and, like, go to, over to BitChute or DLive or anything like that. you got to spread out. In fact, I've actually branched out further. I've gone on TikTok, and I'm on uh, Instagram, and I'm just, you know, spreading my stuff there. Yeah. I was going to try and do a TikTok thing, but then I saw you had to put it on your phone. It was the only way. Oh, Man, just, my, my phone would die. It wouldn't even oh, be yeah. able to handle it if I yeah. put something on there. But yeah. Yeah. spread yeah. just like nature, spread in every direction you can. Yeah, planting nature. seeds. If nature they don't want me there, then eventually it won't be there. But I'll try to be there as much as I can, up in their face. Yeah. And I try to draw people away from those platforms over to my stuff. That way, you're dragging them out of the platform, uh, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. you, you go in and you pull them out. You don't you don't pull yourself out. Yeah, but at the same time, there's and I was going to make a video on this. I don't know if I'll get to it, but it's like I wish that people would watch more YouTube videos. 
that because right now they have with this whole thing going on, they've put so much is being uploaded. I mean, I ha I'm subscribed to like 800 channels and they're mostly talking about the, the nightmare, you know, not the people like us talking about it, but they're the ones doing it. And mm -hmm. it's just conference after conference. And they're, they're telling everything <laughs> they're putting all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, I can't watch it all. There's so many, there's so many things that I wish people would see. And so I know, I don't know. Anyway. I know exactly what you're saying. It's insane. They'll yeah. post like 20 things in one day and you're like, Oh my God, mm -hmm. I can't go through all this. I'm just yeah. going to pick, pick the one at the most, you know, you know, bait worthy title and go through that one first. Yeah. Seriously. Right. So expect that eventually there will be a video for me where I'm like this channel and this channel, and this channel, please go watch yeah, please, them. Please watch Gosh. them. We need your yeah. eyeballs. And, exactly. Like, exactly. And like yeah. Anyone who, anyone who doesn't like make content themselves, like please like go through these things and just send them to us. If you find something interesting, it'll really yeah, helpful. With some timestamps. There's, yeah. yeah, there's so much, that's, there's so much out there. That's that collective free association again. Mm -hmm. The system will come from every angle, and they've already recruited a, a whole lot of people. I mean, psychologically, have recruited them. You know, so they have got literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people pumping this kind of stuff out on a daily basis. So that means it needs thousands and thousands of us to be keeping an eye on all that crap that they put it out there. So yeah, definitely, yeah. And, and I agree, hundred percent. Yeah. I said the same for the past few years. I'm not going until they kick me off, you know, because the, this unfortunately is the main platform for video content. So the 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 majority of the crowd, the mob, is here. So even though I know the algorithm squishes us down, it still means we have that potential of connecting with more people via this platform than any other platform. <coughs> So we stay here until they push us out and then we'll just spread elsewhere. It's like nature always sprouts a little green shoot, no matter how much concrete people try to lay down. <laughs> nature do always that. just waits a little bit and then there's the cracks start to appear and then there's the green shoots again. Uh, but anyway, before I start digressing into rambling again, thanks folks for joining in. Um, check in the info box under the video you'll find links to both Please Stop the Roads channel and Venonymous channel um, again you know, please keep your eyes open keep talking, keep sharing information and remember there is that uh, optimistic possibility that we can change the direction of this, you do not have to enter the gulag you know, opportunity is still there to turn away from it and say, no, thank you. Heck yeah. And turn off your device and go outside and enjoy the weather. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> it's not too rough weather for you. Um, anything else you want to add in, guys, before we go? Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, and thanks. Yeah, it's a good talk. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And it's cold here right now. It's raining yeah. here today. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, get an umbrella. It's dark. I got little tiny snowflakes floating around me, just trying to tease me about you know, it's, it's, it's not quite spring yet. Even though spring is is upon us, it's not here. It never is here in Canada. Uh -huh, Canada. <laughs> you suck, Canada. <laughs> oh, Canada. <laughs> no, better not start doing that. Get too silly. Okay, thanks again, folks. Take care. We'll speak to you again soon. Cut cheese. I'm going to click the button.